distinguished panelists on the dais, ladies and gentlemen, a very good afternoon to you all. I'm happy to be here to share my views on a topic which has assumed extreme importance today. In our country, under our constitution, we have the Union Judiciary under Chapter 6 of Part 5 of the Constitution, which is the Supreme Court. Then we have the High Courts under Part 6 of Chapter 5, a High Court for each state. Sometimes we have one High Court for two states, one High Court for a state and a union territory, or a High Court for a union territory for that matter. Then, of course, we have the subordinate courts, which are covered by part, Chapter 6 of Part 4. The appointment of the district judges under Article 233 and other judges under Article 234. If we go upwards from the lowest level, then so far as appointment of other judges are made, there the governor has to act in accordance with the rules, in accordance with, after, after consultation with the Public Service Commission and after consultation with the High Court. Since these appointments are made on the basis of a competitive examination, followed by an interview conducted by the Public Service Commission in which there are representatives from the judiciary, from the Public Service Commission, and from the Law Secretariat of the State as well. There is not much criticism with regard to these appointments. There is a certain amount of fairness. Under Article 233, the governor in consultation with the High Court exercising jurisdiction is empowered to appoint district judges. The minimum qualification for direct recruitment is seven years practice as an advocate. But even these appointments are made on the basis of a competitive examination followed by an interview. Though there are some appointments which may not be that good, because you know every system has its pitfalls. There is no complaint really with regard to the system of appointing district judges either. Now comes the appointments to the high courts and to the Supreme Court, which is important and which requires a lot of thought. It requires discussions. And under the present system, under the we are bound by the Constitution, I can only say that this election is not easy. It requires care and attention. Talking about the Constitution, the father of the Constitution, B.R. Ambedkar had said, a good Constitution may not be a good Constitution if the persons who are responsible for its operation are not competent. A bad constitution may become a good constitution if the persons who are administering the constitution are good and upright. The same principle, in my view, applies to judicial appointments. There should be Fairness, the 
persons, the selectors, should be persons of integrity, absolutely impartial, and what should be of paramount interest is to have persons in the higher judiciary, in the, in the constitutional courts, the Supreme Court and the High Court, persons who are absolutely independent, persons who are impartial, persons of unquestionable integrity, hardworking persons, persons who read the law, who know the erudite. We should have able erudite judges. Now, the entire object is to have able judges of integrity. There can be no dispute with this proposition. Now the question is, how do we go about it? There have been discussions with regard to the collegium system and whether you agree that there should be a collegium or there should not be a collegium, the fact remains that that is judicially established. So we are bound by the collegium system. There may be criticism of the judgment whereby the 99th Amendment Act of the Constitution was struck down and the provision with regard to appointment on the recommendations of the NJC was struck down. Now, whether you agree with it or not, the fact remains that it there is a judicial pronouncement of the Supreme Court which is binding on all. So what do we do within the system? We are talking about transparency. We are talking about absolute honesty on the part of those who are there. I make it very absolutely clear that I'm not attacking any particular collegium, any particular judge, and I'm not referring to any particular selection or any particular rejection. But I am just talking, talking, I am just giving some examples. Now, before before I forget when we go on to the recommendations which were made, I agree with all of them, except for one. If the, the appointment to a constitutional court is something which is very important. Now, if a collegium on the basis of materials on record has doubts with regard to the correctness of a decision taken, I do not see any reason why the recommendation cannot be reconsidered provided the reasons are honest, the reasons are genuine, and there are grounds for it. I will give you a very small example. I was in the collegium hardly for one month. And that too, I may say, by default. I was appointed under the collegium system. So in that sense, I'm a beneficiary of the collegium system. My appointment may have been delayed. Personally, I was very happy because I always say that my tenure in Madras High Court as its Chief Justice was the best part of my judicial career. So person, personally, I may have been very happy, 
But if you look at Calcutta High Court, between 2013 to 2018, there was no appointment from Calcutta High Court. I got appointed on 7th August 2018. So you talk about regional representation. So here was a chartered high court, one of the oldest high courts in the country, which did not have any representation at all in the Supreme Court from May 2017, when Justice P.C. Ghosh retired, till 7th August, when I was appointed. Now, I, I was in the collegium for, for less than a month by default. Suppose a decision had been taken, not forwarded to the government, but some genuine reasons were discovered. Would the newly constituted collegium become completely powerless when the appointment is such an important appointment? Once a judge is there, what is the procedure for removal? To deal with that, in 1999, the full court of the Supreme Court had evolved a procedure of internal inquiry, which also does not get much publicity. The proceedings are carried out secretly. But be that as it may, at least in one case, where I had recommended the removal of a judge as chairperson of the inquiry committee, nothing happened, except that the judge was not given uh, business. Now, if a judge is simply not given, given business, what happens? Nothing. It's the exchequer who loses out because no work is done. So that recommendation that the decision of a collegium is sacrosanct, today all decisions since 95-96 have been on the basis of the recommendations of a collegium. Some have been cleared by the government, some have not been cleared by the government. That is a different issue altogether. But why are we talking about all this? Why are we talking about transparency today when all the appointments are actually made by the collegium? We must know what is the procedure for selection? What is the discussion that is taking place and if a candidate who has not been considered wants to know the reason why, communication to that candidate. We have to balance the need for an independent, strong, impartial judiciary with the right to equality of possible aspirants. Because an appointment to the higher judiciary involves expenditure on the public exchequer in the form of the salary and the perquisites and the various other privileges which the judges of these constitutional courts enjoy. Not only during their service, there are many benefits which continue till after retirement. Now, under the Constitution itself, there, are, there, there is a criteria for appointment laid down. That is the minimum eligibility. That has to be streamlined. Now, under, 24, uh, uh, under Article 123, Sub-Article 3, the minimum eligibility for appointment to the Supreme Court is that one should have been a judge of the High Court for only five years. 
that makes every judge of the high court except perhaps a few service judges who retire within two to three years of their appointment. Almost all judges who become, um, who get appointed to the high court are eligible to be appointed to the Supreme Court. The other thing is, a person who has been an advocate of high court or two or more high courts in succession for 10 years can be straight away appointed to the Supreme Court. And the third category is distinguished jurist in the opinion of the president. A jurist is an expert in law, but the expression used is distinguished jurist. So what is going to be the criteria for distinguished jurist has to be formulated and laid down in black and white. I always say that in every case, exceptions may be permissible. But when exceptions are made, there should be good reasons given as to why that exception is being made. Again, I will quote with an example. When I was appointed as a judge, when my name was recommended, I was 43. When I was appointed, I was 44 and a few months. I had not completed 45. A few years later, around the time when Justice K.G. Balakrishnan became the Chief Justice of India, he made it an unwritten rule that the minimum age for appointment would be, excuse me, would be for 45 years. But Later on also, persons less than 45 years of age have been appointed. Of course, I don't think it makes a world of difference whether a person is 44 or 46. I always believe in the principle of catch them young. If a person is doing well, if a person is competent, catch him young before he starts earning so much that he will say, I can't manage with the salary and the perquisites which the judge gets. So it is fine to appoint young judges. We have had young judges who have been very good. Our present Chief Justice of India was appointed when he was only 40 or 41 years of age. And I don't think uh, those who have been appointed at 55 are necessarily better than him. Experience may be important, but not a rigid divide. The second factor which is taken into consideration for appointment as a high court judge is income. There is a basic income. Now, this income criteria cannot be a uniform one for the entire country because a person earning in Himachal Pradesh or in Uttarakhand and a person earning in Bombay or Calcutta, you know, it would be like comparing oranges and apples. If you, if you, if you apply, apply the same income criteria for all of them. So what are you going to look at? I will start with the High Court because most of the appointments in the Supreme Court are from amongst High Court judges. But there is something common. People were talking about a secretariat 
or a separate department, a permanent one, I endorse that fully. You have to have a bank, a candidate bank, if I may use the expression. In that candidate bank, you should have names. Since that is a bank, I'm not going into the question of uh, whether it, under whose control that bank is. It may, be a, it may be a secretariat of the collegium. It should be a secretariat of the collegium. But there should be a permanent register maintained of prospective candidates. Now, how do you do this selection? Anybody, but it, it should be recommendation by any judge of a constitutional court for the purpose of consideration, for the cons purpose of inclusion of the name in the bank subject to fulfillment of the other uh, criteria. The recommendation of senior advocates, the top lawyers from the bar, recommendations also from the bar associations. But here, there is a caveat. One should ensure that the recommendations are genuine and not a ploy to appease the bar with a view to secure votes in elections. Please excuse my saying so. I'm always very frank, whether it is about the judiciary, about the lawyers, or any, anybody else. So we have to guard against this aspect. Therefore, I do not say that you do not accept the recommendations which come from the associations. They should be supported by the reasons for the recommendation, which should have certain particulars of the cases handled. Similarly, there may be others. Dr. Mohan Gopal, who has headed the National Judicial Academy for a number of years, he may be in a position to suggest from out of the resource persons, from out of the participants, from out of his interactions. Consider them. It is only you're preparing a bank. From that bank, you select the best. Now, what are the factors one is to look into? I think the academic background of a person is important. You can't ignore it altogether. So the academic background, the practice, court appearances, decisions reported and unreported, drafting skills, proficiency over the language as of now, the language of the high courts and of the Supreme Court is English. By proficiency over language, I don't talk of writing literature the way some of our judges in the past have written their judgments. I speak of correct, intelligible language which will be understood by all. And I think the drafting skill is very important. You assess the drafting skills in the origin, in the, in the high courts which have an original site, usually the name of the draftsman is mentioned in the plaint. Even otherwise, you can hold discussions with senior counsel who may have had the occasion to go, go through the pleadings. Now, coming to the appointment to the Supreme Court. Usually, since, since I have been in the collegium for a short while, and 
Though I was the Chief Justice of Madras High Court for a year and a half, uh, for the first few months, there was no occasion for me to hold a collegium or to decide because Justice S.K. Call, my predecessor in office, very efficient as he is, he had recommended names in anticipation, which again should be done. The day a judge is appointed, the date of retirement of that judge is known. So I see no reason why the process of consideration or the process of consultation should commence after the judge has retired or just prior to his retirement. This can be done well in advance for a proper selection. Now talking about my Madras experience, you know, these things also happen. First few months, I was not in a position to hold a collegium. Then we decided on a name which had been actually recommended by my predecessor in office, but had not been cleared on the ground of want of experience. The ethics of the gentleman, I would say, was remarkable in today's world. Since his father was a judge, he decided to take up teaching. He was a professor of law. He came back. Now, I decided to reconsider his name because by that time he also had sufficient years as a lawyer. My second judge put a condition on me and that too through my personal secretary, through my PPS. He said, for, on, on, the, on the first day, he said he needed to consider. So I said, certainly. Every judge has to consider. consider. On the, a, f a few days later, I was given a name in a slip of paper, the name of a lawyer I had not um, had occasion to assess. And I was told that tell ma'am, I'll agree to her name if she proposes to this name. I said, sorry, I have no personal interest in any, any appointment. I was doing what was good for the institution, and I'm not going to compromise with the good of the institution. I'm glad the candidate is a judge of the Madras High Court today. I did not have the privilege of recommending his name under these circumstances, but I had occasion to clear his name as a consulty judge when I was in the Supreme Court. Justice Ruma Pal, who had been a member of the Collegium for a while, had shortly after her retirement written an article which I had read in the papers, where she had said that what goes on in the Collegium is often you scratch my back and I scratch yours. This must have been said by her in 2006, she had retired on, th on and from 3rd June 2006, and this article came out shortly afterwards. Now, this is most unfortunate. We have to remember what is the oath of office which we take it is as per the third schedule. We take a vow of allegiance to the Constitution of India. We promise to uphold the sovereignty and integrity 
of India and to discharge our duties of office to the best of our ability, knowledge and judgment without fear, favor, affection or ill will. This does not say judicial functions. It says discharge the duties of my office. So when a judge discharges duties, whether the duties are judicial duties or administrative duties, this oath has to be kept in mind. It has to be without fear or favor. What, sorry, two minutes, okay. It may become three. It's very difficult to... Now, it is quite possible that at a given point of time, you may have five names. And the collegium thinks that they are all capable, but recommends the name only of four candidates because there are four vacancies there, or only four vacancies are contemplated. It should not happen that with the change of collegium or change of chief justice, you forget about that candidate altogether. So this uniformity and cons consistency should be there. A lot of it is, of course, corridor gossip. We don't exactly know what is happening inside the collegium because the proceedings in the collegium are not publicized. But you should also not give your ears to gossip because just the other day, you know, one of the judges appointed was recommended, uh, appointed to the Supreme Court was recommended two days after my retirement. And there were a lot of collegium meetings held while I was still there. I don't want to discuss what happened during the collegium meetings because I am also bound to maintain the secrecy until the system is changed. Very recently, a friend from the bar came and told me, yes, we heard that the name could not be recommended because you told the collegium that the name should be recommended after your retirement because there is going to be a super session and you are close to both of them. I looked at him and I said, what am I to take this as? A compliment that I should never have been on the bench of the Supreme Court. Is that the level of my personality? my courage of conviction, was I expected to decide as per my personal relationships with people sitting there or the competence of the candidate. So it was certainly not correct that I made any, any request of this kind at all. Anything more about the collegium where differences arose, with whom differences arose, with regard to whom differences arose, I will not like to talk about. There were four or five collegium meetings, which no final decision was taken. The final decision was taken two days after my retirement, after Justice Joseph came into the collegium. Now, Justice Joseph, being the conscientious kind that he is, I'm sure, he had been making a study on his own of the candidates. But very often, when uh, it, is the, it is the Chief Justice who decides it's the Chief Justice who make, makes the recommendation. 
the names are disclosed to other collegium members and the collegium members consult, discuss and then there's a vote. There is a third thing last I'm concluding. I, I, won't, I won't take any more time. We talk about regional representation. We talk about social diversity. But here again, we do not follow a very uniform policy. Of course, variations have to be made, as I said. Now, if there is no suitable candidate from a particular state, what do you do? You can't appoint an incompetent person. But then there should be a reason recorded somewhere as to why you are unable to ignore, uh, unable to consider any candidate from those states. Secondly, there should be exceptions to the principle of uh, regional representation. Actually, I should not be taking names, but we talk about gender imbalance. After my, I was very happy when three judges were sworn in on the same day. But then after my retirement, there, there's only three. So many names were recommended, but no, there was no woman recommended. Why not? Possibly because of this regional representation policy. I see no reason why a second woman cannot be taken from the same high court. If that woman is otherwise competent, she may have handled very high profile cases. She may have expertise in a particular branch of law on which we need to give attention because cases with regard to life and liberty are pending for years, so we may need lawyers who may be proficient in criminal law. We may be, we may, may be need, we may, may, may need lawyers proficient in a certain area of law. But what happens is that we have one lady, we have three others, so there are four from one high court. Why can't we have the fifth one. And last, the collegiums should refrain from hearsay. I have heard many of my panelists may know about this, that my former colleague of Delhi High Court, his pet name was Boozer. But he was a teetotaler, unfortunately, or fortunately, whatever it is. His name was cleared by the collegium. The police report was that he was a drunkard. <laughs> many, many years later, he was elevated to the bench, but by that time, he had a very short tenure there. So if there is, if there are whispers, if there are murmurs, if may, it may be a good idea for the collegium to invite the judge concerned or the prospective judge in the case of the High Court for a cup of tea and to get a clarification and then make some further inquiry before taking a final decision. Thank you very much. There is a lot more to say, but then I can't eat up everyone else's time. Thank you. <laughs>